Good day, everybody. My name is Bob Basir. I'm one of the co-investigators of the National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative. And I want to spend a little bit of time today talking to you about the pilot study that we did here in Detroit that is essentially getting um, the National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative kicked off. Um, this is my contact information. Uh, happy to field any questions and concerns uh, you have about the project and, and how you can get involved. I have uh, no relevant disclosures in regards to the Detroit or the National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative. Over the course of the last 20 years, we really haven't seen a significant change in AMI and cardiogenic shock. Despite multiple trials, the mortality rate has been hovering around 50%. So we've seen therapies evaluated in the shock trial, the shock two trial, and most recently the culprit shock trial. But one of the things that we've learned from these studies is despite therapies, um, the current practice is resulting in about a 50% survival. So we got together here in Detroit to try to be able to change these outcomes and see if there was anything that we could do and implement to be able to change um, the horrific course of this disease. You can see from uh, this graph uh, that the red line indicates that patients in AMI and cardiogenic shock are still on the rise. This has likely contributed to the aging population and advancing therapies for stable uh, ischemic cardiomyopathies as well as um, uh, general uh, medical uh, care for AMI patients. But one of the concerning findings is, is that despite the negative trials, uh, over 40% of patients still continue to receive intraaortic balloon pump, a therapy that hasn't been shown yet to improve survival in this patient cohort. Um, we have sought out to seek if Impella, a more robust form of hemodynamic support, can potentially change these outcomes um, in our patients who present with AMI and cardiogenic shock. So this schematic essentially shows that there's a bell-shaped curve in our current AMI and shock data. Um, and so there are centers who are using the device well and getting really good outcomes. And there are centers who are using the device usually probably in a late stage where even advanced hemodynamic support may not be helpful. So what we wanted to do was to try to look back at this data and try to be able to identify markers um, that were associated with survival and see if we could prospectively implement those measures to improve outcomes. So the way that this all started was the Detroit Cardiogenic Shock Initiative was a collaboration of four healthcare systems in the Metro Detroit area. This happened under the leadership and mentorship of Bill O'Neill, who collaborated with um, uh, core providers at each of the following institutions, the Detroit Medical Center under the leadership of Ted Schreiber, um, Beaumont Healthcare under the leadership of Simon Dixon, and St. Joe's Pontiac Hospital under the leadership of Kirit Patel, and essentially got together and um, identified the problem and current outcomes in AMI and cardiogenic shock and looked to build a collaborative approach to see if we could improve outcomes in our local areas, similarly to the historic improvements that we had done in primary angioplasty decades ago. And so essentially we came together in uh, informal settings uh, to come up with a protocol that we implemented within each of our healthcare systems. And then we studied this to see if there would be a benefit to other patients on a national level. The first thing that we noticed going back to the original observational data was that patients who had uh, hemodynamic support placed early within their um, shock state, so when they were on zero pressors or one presser, tended to do significantly better than patients who were started on multiple pressors and inotropes and left um, robust hemodynamic support only for refractory cases. Similarly, patients who had invasive hemodynamics and guidance of medical therapy based on invasive hemodynamics tended to do better as well. So as we implemented our protocol, these are key things that we've included, um, uh, included within the protocol. Another point is, is that um, hemodynamic support put in early tended to improve survival. So patients who came to the hospital um, within 75 minutes uh, who were able to get um, revascularization as well as hemodynamic support tended to do significantly better than those who had a delay in their therapy. 
And similarly, uh, patients who had hemodynamic support placed prior to their PCI before the intervention itself tended to do better as well. So these were, again, core principles that were included within the algorithm. As we all know, patients who present with AMI and cardiogenic shock tend to be on a spectrum of disease. And so it's really important for us to define a patient set that we studied and uh, make sure that our uh, outcomes are appropriately understood. So these were not patients who were in a pre-shock scenario. And similarly, they were not patients who were in a refractory shock setting, in which case a robust hemodynamic support may not be useful uh, given the refractory state of their shock. As we all know, randomized control trials in AMI and cardiogenic shock are very difficult to implement. Multiple uh, institutions and groups have come together to try to do a randomized control trial in this patient cohort and have unfortunately uh, been unsuccessful, either due to discontinuation secondary to lack of funding or due to slow enrollment. And so uh, we wanted to take a step back and implement a protocol um, that was easy to be studied. And so we implemented implemented it in a retrospective manner as a review to be able to understand how the uh, algorithm and protocol affected our patients here in Detroit. Our inclusion criteria was similar to all the prior um, shock studies. Um, AMI was defined based on both symptoms as well as EKG or biomarker evidence of an acute MI. Cardiogenic shock was defined as a blood pressure less than 90 over 60 or the need of vasopressors and inotropes to maintain that blood pressure and evidence of end organ hypoperfusion. Our exclusion criteria was similar as well. Um, we did have an additional exclusion criteria of evidence of anoxic brain injury. Clearly these patients, despite uh, surviving um, their event, would have a poor prognosis, as well as patients who had an unwitnessed cardiac arrest that uh, lasted more than uh, 30 minutes. Similarly, patients who were treated with balloon pump prior to the uh, Ampella were not included. And this was to really make sure that we were studying the outcomes associated with early hemodynamic support. The Detroit algorithm starts with identifying patients rapidly who are presenting an AMI and cardiogenic shock. The next step is thereafter based on um, how the patient presents clinically. Patients who present with large anterior AMIs and low blood pressures with a diagnosis of shock can obtain femoral access, um, check an LVEDP to confirm that an LVEDP is elevated and there's, there's no signs of hypovolemia or hemorrhagic shock, and then place hemodynamic support. In the scenario, however, that the AMI is um, uh, questioned or the state of shock is questioned, doing a left heart cath and coronary angiogram or doing a right heart cath is absolutely permitted within the algorithm. So the emphasis is, pl is placed on a protocol-driven treatment with early identification of cardiogenic shock. After this, patients receive PCI as would be performed routinely. And after their PCI is completed, we take some time and uh, it, uh, analyze the invasive hemodynamics. And the two parameters that we look at are the cardiac power output as well as the pulmonary artery pulsatility index. The cardiac power output was studied in the original shock trial and was found to be a marker that was very sensitive and specific to the degree of cardiogenic shock. And Patients who had a cardiac power output less than 0.6 had an associated high mortality. And so patients within our cohort who have a cardiac power output less than 0.6 after um, PCI and after um, a robust hemodynamic support uh, should be considered for escalation of hemodynamic support, whether that's right-sided support or left-sided support. To further evaluate the need for right-sided support, we've evaluated the PAPI, the Pulmonary Artery Pulsatility Index, which is a simple calculation of your systolic PA pressure minus your diastolic PA pressure divided by your RA pressure. Um, the cutoff that we use for the PAPI is less than 0.9, which indicates that the patient may, if clinically um, uh, agreeable, have right heart dysfunction. In that scenario, a patient would go on to have a right-sided hemodynamic support, again, with a emphasis on repeating the invasive hemodynamics and further evaluating. 
The specific escalation strategies have not been determined by the protocol because they are uh, regionally based. So patients who may go on to have a 5-0 axillary impella placed surgically should go on to do so. Patients who may need a tandem heart or may need ECMO with an impella shunt would also be proceeded based on local practice patterns. Before the patient leaves the cath lab, a vascular assessment, both in terms of angiography and Doppler, should be performed to confirm that there's no lower extremity ischemia. If there is, patients should go on to have anti-grade perfusion catheters placed um, using a variety of techniques that will be described um, later in the talk. The emphasis of the protocol, therefore, is um, based on rapid support to PCI time using invasive hemodynamics to make determinations for weaning of vasopressors and inotropes and if needed escalation, decreasing vas vasopressors and inotropes as possible, and early escalation if indicated. Good ICU level care needs to be continued to be performed in a multidisciplinary fashion, getting uh, other internal medicine services involved, as well as the need for involvement of cardiothoracic surgery, or as well as heart failure um, colleagues as well. Based on uh, this algorithm, the Detroit group initiated five quality control measures to be able to track outcomes. The ability to reach a door to support time less than 90 minutes, the ability to establish TIMI3 flow in the culprit lesion, the ability to wean vasopressors and inotropes, the ability to maintain a cardiac power output greater than 0.6, and to be able to improve survival greater than 80%. The results of our initiative included 50 patients. This was a sick cohort of patients, including seven patients who had out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, 17 who had in-hospital cardiac arrest, and the overall survival of our cohort was 76%. This was significantly higher than the prior studies, including the SHOCK trial, as well as the IMPRESS trial. When you compare our study to the previous studies, we find that our cohort was slightly younger at the age of 65, 92% of patients required vasopressors and inotropes. Their hemodynamics were consistent with um, cardiogenic shock with a median lactate level of 4.7. So despite having hemodynamics consistent with cardiogenic shock and uh, uh, patient profile similar to prior studies, our survival was significantly higher compared to those studies. You can see from this graph as well that the cardiac power output measurements did not just improve on, uh, in, within the cath lab, but were maintained over the first 24 hours. The right-sided graph similarly shows that those patients who presented with right heart catheterization prior to having hemodynamic support and then had a right heart catheterization again after the support was placed all had significant improvals in their overall cardiac power output, showing the dramatic difference that cardiac, um, that mechanical circulatory support is able to provide such patients. You can see from this graph that um, we were able to achieve a rapid door to support time with most patients having support times uh, under 90 minutes. Similarly, in this graph, we can see that patients who presented and got hemodynamic support early, whether they survived or did not survive, were able to wean off vasopressors within the first 24 hours, and their lactate levels also similarly decreased within the first 24 hours, indicating the improvement that patients receive with, dramatic, with rapid um, hemodynamic support placement and revascularization. So this table is likely the most important table within the, uh, the study. And what it shows is the out different outcomes in the first and second half of the study. And just like you would expect in anything that's implemented within interventional cardiology, it takes time for others to implement and adopt such algorithms. And so our first 25 patients had impella support before their PCI in about 65% of their cases. And they had a right heart cath in about 80% of their times. 
The second half, that dramatically increased with the pre-PCI and pellet support being placed in over 75% of patients and a right heart cath being performed in greater than 90% of patients. And you can see from this table that overall survival increased over time. And so when a protocol like this is implemented, there's always an early learning curve, but as the protocol and the algorithm become more adopted, the outcomes continue to improve as we've seen in the Detroit study. Because of the success that we've had here in Detroit, we are now implementing the National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative. So we have hospitals and healthcare systems across the country who are coming together to try to improve outcomes in AMI and cardiogenic shock. And so they're joining the National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative. We have approximately 40 to 50 sites who are interested, and that number continues to grow. Our first national site was Mercy Fitzgerald Hospital in Philadelphia, who has already enrolled two patients at the time of this recording. Similar to Detroit, other centers are coming together to work together to improve outcomes in AMI and cardiogenic shock, emphasizing invasive hemodynamics, um, the ability to deliver rapid hemodynamic support, and the ability to provide good um, PCI results. In conclusion, rapid early delivery of mechanical circulatory support guided by invasive hemodynamics is associated with improved outcomes in the Detroit Cardiogenic Shock Initiative. The treatment should be delivered using a systematic approach, emphasizing teamwork and regional shock protocols. If there's ABCs of shock, our ABCs are to obtain access, obtain basic hemodynamics, provide circulatory support, um, decrease use of vasopressors and inotropes, and perform early escalation if clinically indicated. These are the collaborators across the four healthcare systems, and we invite you to get more information about the National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative. If you're interested in enrolling and getting more information, please vid visit us at the website indicated below, www.henryford.com slash cardiogenic shock, and we'd be more than happy to help assist you. Thank you so much.